Anyway, uh, we're at the end of 2 Thessalonians. And though we've only really had two, two weeks in Thessalonians, and then this is 2 Thessalonians, and this week, we only have two more weeks after this week, and then we're in 1 Timothy. So, so really, just five total messages in 2 Thessalonians. This is the third of five. I often talk about how we handle adversity, and I feel like a broken record when I say, and this is something I say to my kids, it's something I say to the church here, is uh, it's not how you handle success that shows what you are, it's how you handle failure. And uh, again, being, being involved in my youth sports and, and youth coaching and stuff like that, it's, it's easy, it's easy for me to see this in real life on a ball field or even at a basketball court or, or whatever. So you see a kid, things don't go the way they want it to go. They don't get the call. Uh, it reminds me of um, it reminds me of a game last summer where a kid was pitching and he's just throwing a temper tantrum on the mound because he doesn't like the umpire's calls. And and what, what I try to teach Josh is and I, and, and I'll, we play a game where he throws balls and strikes and I. And I'll call a strike, I'll call it a ball on purpose. And he'll just be like, what? And I'll be like, you know this happens. You know, this is a lesson. The lesson is sometimes strikes are going to get called balls, right? And you deal with adversity a certain way. How you deal with it is a reflection of what your character is, who you are. Well, this kid, he was flipping out. Um, and and he, he threw something and the umpire didn't see. In, in, in our league, if you throw a helmet, you're out. You don't get a second, you don't get a warning, you're out. So you get kicked out of the game. If you throw any equipment, you get kicked out of the game. And that's the way it should be. It really should be that way. But um, even if you're swinging and you throw a bat by accident, you get one warning for that, for accidental throwing. You do it a second time accidentally, you're out of the game. So, uh, so there's some positive things there about discipline. Well, this kid didn't get caught. And then he did it the second time. He took his helmet and he threw it and he got caught and he got thrown out of the game right then and there. And I was like, good, this is good. This kid shouldn't be playing the game if he can't be responsible. So I'll see kids flip out on, on the ball field and um, because, it, because some didn't go the way they wanted them to go or they didn't get the call they wanted to get or whatever else. And then I'll see other kids who fail and they handle that adversity tremendously differently. To be honest with you, uh, just looking at uh, Josh in the spring, the way I saw him handle adversity in the spring, and the way I saw him handle adversity in the fall, it was like two different kids. I was really happy. I told him how many times I tell you, Josh, how happy I was about how you handle adversity in the fall. How how, how pleased I was with you. Um, you know, I see I see the same thing in adults. I see some adults face adversity because remember the Thessalonian church is facing adversity. They're in the midst of persecution. I see some adults face adversity, or, or maybe something doesn't go their way, something doesn't go the way they wanted it to go. And I'll see sometimes people throw a little temper tantrum. More than one time have I seen someone storm out of my office in anger because they didn't like something that happened. And I've also seen the exact same adversity being handled in humility and godliness. And so when I make the statement that it's not how you handle success that shows what you are, it's how you handle failure that shows what you really are, that comes with a lot of, that comes with, I, I watch, I like to, like I said, I like to, I like to watch kids on the, ball, on the ball field. And sometimes the kid tells me something about the parent, right? Sometimes the parent tells me something about the kid and, and so on. But um, here, when we're looking at the second letter to the Thessalonians, and this is a young church that's facing persecution. They're handling adversity, and, and they're persevering through it. They're genuinely saved. They're persevering through it. Paul's thankful for that. And, and yet, even though they're, they're persevering, persevering through this, this, uh, this affliction, this, this trouble, they're confused at times about some things. They were confused, for instance, about the day of the Lord. So some false doctrine had crept in here, and false teachers have said that the day of the Lord has already passed. And this has messed with their minds a little bit. They were disturbed by this message a little bit. And that's what we looked at last week. The last paragraph is really about handling that, how they were troubled, they were disturbed by this false teaching that had crept in. And so Paul, in that paragraph, reminds them of this great apostasy. Remember we looked at that? Uh, this great apostasy that would 
take place before Jesus returns. And he reminds them about the man of lawlessness. Remember we, we, we talked about the word, was that last Sunday night we talked about the word anemia? Um, or, uh, and did we talk about that here? Or even like an antinomia without, well, was that, that was a man's Bible study, wasn't it? That was here last week? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So this man of lawlessness, this guy who's against the law, right? Um, or, or even without law. Uh, the Antichrist, and, and, and Paul writes about how he'll do all kinds of false signs and wonders, and how he'll take the seat in the temple, and he'll speak great blasphemies, and he'll claim to be God, uh, but he'll be destroyed by the mouth of Jesus, and he'll be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is his second death. Now, uh, just for some trivia, just to kind of like get you guys, you know, thinking a little bit, get you guys <clears throat> involved in case asleep. When is the Antichrist cast into the lake of fire? I'm not asking for like a year. I'm asking for like biblical timeline. When is the Antichrist cast into the lake of fire? Isn't it when uh, Christ puts down the rebellion? And then... Which rebellion? When Jesus comes back at his second coming, at the end of the tribulation period, right, of Revelation 19, he takes the Antichrist and the false prophet, and he casts them into the lake of fire, right? What, what happens when, when does Satan get cast into the lake of fire? Second. What's that? Second. I'm sorry, I'm not here to have Second. So, so there's, what, what, when you say the rebellion, you're talking about this whole Armageddon business, right? The Battle of Megiddo, which isn't a battle at all, and it's kind of like described in Revelation 19. Then we have Revelation 20, we have this thousand years, right, during which Satan is bound. At the end of that thousand years, he's released, and there's what, the, the term that you're using here is second rebellion, I think that's fair, you can use that term, right? The second rebellion of, of, of the tribulation period, whatever we want to call that. Um, so, so the timing of these things are different. It gets a little confusing if, if, if you're not like refreshed on it and you get that messed up. But that's okay. It's, it's uh, only the end of the world that we're talking about. So, um, you know, we're not going to be there. Yeah, we won't be here. It's okay. <laughs> well, um, we we're going to be returning charge. at that time. Yeah. Maybe we think so. What's that? We know who's in charge. But it was interesting. Okay, we'll take that. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the Antichrist, uh, before he gets cast in the lake of fire, he's going to deceive the world. And uh, the world's going to follow him into destruction. And this will happen because they rejected the gospel. They rejected the truth for the lie. And God gave them over to a reprobate mind, and God sent a strong delusion, and they accept that lie. They reject the truth, they accept the lie. And they also will spend eternity in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You can read about that in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, I think. So, yeah, 20 verses 11 through 15. But the church, the true people of God, can confidently wait for Jesus to come back. These Thessalonians might be confused at the time that Paul writes that maybe they've missed the day of the Lord because false doctrine has crept in. False doctrine not tremendously different than the false doctrine that Jehovah's Witnesses are maybe spreading, that Jesus has already come back invisibly. Well, something like that, perhaps, is being spread in Thessalonica, and these guys wonder if they missed it, but they can be confident that they will be with Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ will come for them, and he will set up his kingdom. They can have confidence in his return. And so Paul, at the end of chapter 2, Paul is thankful for these Thessalonians, and for the genuine salvation. And we see that in verse 13. <clears throat> but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification, by the Spirit, and faith in the truth. Uh, we're going to unpack this a little bit. Uh, notice the first part of the verse. But we should always give thanks to God for you. Um, there's emphasis here in the original language with we. So it, 
If we were, if I was, if I was writing this today, I would write "we" in all caps, or you might see "we" in bold, or something like that. Right? It's it's emphasizing the the writers here. Um, we should be thankful for you. It's kind of emphasized a little bit too. Uh, Perhaps in the Thess Thessalonians' mindset, they were thankful for the Apostle Paul. Remember, these guys received the, the, the Gospel. They received the Apostle Paul as he really was from God. And so they're thankful for Paul, but Paul is equally, if not greater, more thankful for them because of their genuine salvation. And I notice he also calls them brethren. This is the third time in this letter that he calls them, in short letter, that he calls them brothers, and it shows confidence in their genuine salvation. He calls them brethren beloved by the Lord. I think it's a, a fair question, perhaps for us, to even ask ourselves in the church, are we genuine, are we genuine brethren, right? Um, Paul had a confidence that these guys were genuine. Have I placed my faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross? I think uh, a lot of times in we're, we're, we're talking uh, in the last couple of weeks in Sunday school about how to stop or how to help prevent a church being full of, or a mixture of saved and unsaved. Because we believe in, we believe in the doctrine of um, regenerate church membership or uh, saved church membership. And so Paul seems to have this confidence in these believers at Thessalonica, and it's easy to have that confidence because they're dealing with persecution and they're persevering through it. In our day, it's not quite as easy to have that confidence. I mean, there's certain things that, like, like I can look at certain believers and just be like, I have a lot of confidence in these people. And one of the, one of the key characteristics that give me confidence in a person's genuine salvation is, is their faithfulness, right? If a person is faithful, then it's easy to be confident in that person's salvation, right? Just like Paul. Paul's looking at the Thessalonians and looking at their faithfulness. He's looking at, these guys are faithful even in the midst of tremendously difficult circumstances. And so it's easy to be confident that these guys are brothers, that they are the beloved of the Lord. It's easy for me to look at the faithful the same way. And it's hard for me to look at people who are not faithful to worship and have that same confidence. You understand what I'm saying? Does this, does this make sense? Like, like if you have, I'm going to use an extreme circumstance. You have a, you have a guy that shows up for worship a few times a year. It's, it's like, I don't know about that guy. I don't know if that guy's genuinely, genuinely saved. Or, or maybe someone who, who's, who's, whose worship commitment is maybe like a once a month type of a thing. And there are circumstances maybe that, that are affecting that. I understand there are circumstances at times. But uh, someone who can be here and who, who isn't worshiping and is part of our body, it's like, I don't know. Quite that same confidence. You can even have people who are faithful to worship services, right? And yet their lives, are, it's like, I don't have confidence in that guy's salvation because his life is not consistent with his testimony. And so we, 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 we experience all that stuff. And Paul here looks at these Thessalonians, he sees their faithfulness, he sees their perseverance, and he considers them to be genuinely saved. He's convinced of their genuine salvation. And not just, not just, it's not just him, but it's Paul and Silas and Timothy. We should always give thanks to God for you. It wasn't easy in Thessalonica for Paul. Remember, he had to flee. But the trouble he faced there, that followed him, to Berea in the second missionary journey, it was worth it because these guys were genuinely saved. And that's kind of how we can read that a little bit in context. Notice the grounds for their thankfulness, for Paul and Silas and Timothy's thankfulness. We should always give thanks to God for you. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Look at that. Now this is a verse that people in our circles, that is um, 
when I say arc circles, I, I tend to mean those of a non-Calvinistic type of event, right? We don't like that verse. We, I, I, I've heard many times that this verse meant something different. And I heard all types of explanations about what this verse meant. When I look at it in context, it's like, People in our circles are just trying to explain this thing away because they want to reject what this passage says. And I think that's error. That's error. The passage is clear. Uh, God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Paul recognizes God's election of the Thessalonians. He recognizes that God elected them for salvation, that God has chosen them from the beginning for salvation. Both of, these, both of these ideas here are modifying God's election of them. And so God, he, he chooses them from the beginning, before the foundations of the world, and he chooses them for salvation. I need to clarify this a little bit. Uh, we do not reject the doctrine of election. I would say this, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, I'm not arguing a Calvinistic perspective here, but you have to hear what I'm saying. We do not reject, if we are being true to the biblical text, we do not and cannot reject the doctrine of election. God elected before the foundation of the world. What we all agree about, those of us who are taking an honest look at scripture, is that God has elected what we disagree about is the basis for that election. So there's confusion in our circles. There are people in our circles that basically try to do away with the doctrine of election because they're trying to like oppose the Calvinistic view of the doctrine of election. And I would say that's error. I would say that's that's unfortunate, that's a mistake. Where they're, they're looking, they're, they're, they're denying the biblical doctrine. We accept the doctrine of election. The basis of it is where we differ. A Calvinistic position would say that God elected some on the basis of nothing but his perfect will, or something like that, his own good pleasure. Uh, I would uh, snidely call that um, arbitrary election, right? Um, that's kind of like name calling a little bit, you know what I mean? Uh, that's maybe not the fairest way to describe it, but I, I, like, I like to use that term. If, if God elected just because he elected, there's, there's no really rhyme or reason to that election. That's not the position we hold. That would be more of like a hyper-Calvinistic perspective. Our perspective is that God elected according to foreknowledge. All right, that's 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. And the way we would understand that is not that God has to look down through the dawns of time to figure out who one day would be accept Jesus by faith, or accept Jesus into their heart, or you know, pray the sinner's prayer, or some kind of garbage like that, right? It's not that. It's not that God has to look down through the dawns of time to figure out who would be saved. God's foreknowledge is God's perfect knowledge of all things, past, present, and future, actual or possible. And so before the foundations of time, God elects some on the basis of foreknowledge. God's perfect. You cannot take God's knowledge of all things out of the equation. I would argue that the hyper-Calvinistic perspective has to take God's perfect knowledge of all things out of the equation to a certain extent. Um, but uh, there, are, there are some good people that would, that would disagree with me on that. The scriptures show us that God is elected on the basis of foreknowledge. Those who would take our position should not reject the doctrine of election. I would say the ignorant do that. Those in our position who are theologically ignorant are afraid of the doctrine of election. We need not be. It's not the doctrine of election that's, at, that's, that's, that's in question. It's the basis of the election. Did God elect simply according to his own good pleasure? And we would say, well, well yeah, that, that's certainly part of it. Did God elect on the basis of his perfect knowledge of all things, actual, present, actual or possible past, present, future? You'd say, yes, that's true. God elected on the basis of everything that he knows 
and you cannot remove that from the equation. So, if you're confused about that, we probably have like a 15 or 20 part series that you can listen to from uh, Sunday school that was taught probably about five years ago. But anyway, uh, notice what else is involved in this election. Uh, check it out. Uh, we see the means of the election. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Again, to deny, to deny the election is to deny scripture. It's not the election that the difference is about. It's the basis of it. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. That is, God's Holy Spirit has set us apart. That's what that word sanctify means. Sanctification means to be set apart. Uh, the first part of, of sanctification is positional sanctification, right? That is, we are set apart. We are, we are no longer enemies of God. We are friends of God. We were taken out of the world. We were placed into the body of Christ. Okay, that's like a positional sanctification. That's, sal that's salvation. There is the progressive aspect of, of sanctification where we're growing closer to the Lord, right? We, we, pro we progress. We grow closer to the Lord throughout our lives. And then there's that ultimate aspect of sanctification, which is when we are given glorified bodies upon Jesus' return. We are glorified. All right, so we are set apart by God's Holy Spirit. Uh, notice uh, the means here. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through faith in the truth. So this is really dealing with the Spirit's role in setting us apart for salvation. Not saying that um, necessarily that salvation is by some act of, uh, of, uh, of, of second grace or something like that, like the charismatic would say. Like some charismatics say that if you don't receive a second blessing, you're not genuinely saved. You might have heard of uh, some of the theological errors, like uh, has anyone ever heard of the Azusa Street Revival, or the Toronto Blessing, or the Third Wave of the Holy Spirit, any of these, these charismatic Pentecostal theologies? Um, they, want, they want to try to claim that salvation is only taking place through some work of God's, God's Holy Spirit. It's manifested by like tongues or something like that. No, no, this is just God's Spirit has set you apart. God's Spirit gives you life, all right? But it's through faith in Jesus Christ here we see in this passage. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. We'll unpack that a little more in a few minutes. Uh, these Thessalonians heard the gospel message. Do we read that? We read that in 1 Thessalonians. Do we read how they received God's message by, as from God and accepted it by faith? That's the context of the statement like this. They placed their faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross, that's how they were saved. That's how we're saved. God has chosen the Thessalonians for salvation on the basis of his perfect knowledge of all things, past, present, and future. And we are saved by grace through faith. Now, again, I want to I say some more about that, but I, I just, just let me press pause on that for a second. Okay? Because we're going to come back to that idea. Um, he calls them by means of the gospel message. Look at verse 14. It was for this... He called you, or it was for this for which he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God calls the Thessalonians to salvation through our gospel. He calls them to salvation through the preaching of the cross. Uh, by the way, that's the same way God calls people to be saved today, through the preaching of the cross. If uh, there, there's this, there's this. This conversation, this debate about, you know, calling, and there are people who want to make, you know, there's, there's this type of calling, and there's this type of calling, and, and uh, I, I, I just want to say, I used to see this a little more in theory. I'm, I'm holding this a little more personally myself today. God is calling all men to be saved. God is, call, God is calling all men to repent everywhere. All men everywhere to repent. And he is... He's calling them through the gospel message. He is calling for them to repent, to place their faith in what God has accomplished in the gospel. This is maybe how it works. God is sending this gospel message out through, through people, right? Through, through preachers, through evangelists, whatever. 
and a person hears this message and they're open to it, God is convicting. God is moving. God is working. God is drawing them. Remember we talked about this like, like probably, probably about five years ago, we had a pretty in-depth conversation. At the time, I was like, ah, I'm not sure, because I was resistant to the idea of any type of like efficacious drawing or anything like that. Not that, not that I'm holding to that today. But, um, but, but, but the mechanism is, if you're, if you're closing your heart off to God, well, God's not going to continue to be able to convict you. You're, you're shutting him out. You understand? How is he going to continue to convict you? How is he going to continue to draw you in by means of his message of the gospel? Um, here, God calls us through the message of the gospel. We must respond by faith. We must respond to the gospel. It's the only way a person can be saved. I must respond to the gospel. If I shut God out, I'm rejecting the only means of my salvation. I'm rejecting the only truth that can bring me life. If I'm open to God's truth, he continues to convict. He continues to draw. And if I continue to be open to the truth, he continues to convict. He continues to, until, until one day, I, you know, I submit my life to him. I am accepting you by faith. And it's a whole, it's a whole new life. This is, this is not some irresistible thing that God is, is, is doing for me. It's something that I'm, I'm taking part of by faith. It's something God, God requires me. To have faith. Anyway, um, it was for this he called you through our gospel. It is a response to the gospel that leads to my salvation. That you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Thessalonians will receive what all believers receive, and that is glory when Jesus comes. Uh, for now, the Thessalonians are receiving shame. As they're persecuted by their lost, uh, by the lost officials, town officials of Thessalonica. Uh, they're suffering humiliation. Uh, by the way, they rejoice that they're counted worthy to suffer shame. That's what we read in the book of Acts, right? But in that day, it won't be shame, it'll be glory. And one day, we also will be glorified. And so Paul's thankful for their genuine salvation, and he encourages them to hold fast to sound doctrine in verse 15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Paul, again, for the fourth time in this letter, calls them brethren. Speaks of this confidence of their genuine salvation. They are genuinely saved. They have responded to the gospel message. They have placed their faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross, and thus they are genuinely saved. Paul calls them brethren, and he tells them to stand firm. Uh, they are not to be shaken by false doctrine. They are not to be disturbed by false theology. They are to hold fast to sound doctrine. They are to hold fast to the teachings of the apostles. Uh, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught. Paul had spent time teaching them the Word of God. He had handed down traditions from Jesus Christ. Can we think of a tradition that Paul would have handed down to the Thess Thessalonians? Perhaps he wrote about one of these traditions in the letter to the Corinthians. This is a pretty big hint. You should be able to get this one. A tradition that Paul handed down. Communion, right? The Lord's table. Uh, you can read about that, and that's, that's one of the traditions that Paul would have handed, handed down. Um, stand for hold to the traditions which you were taught, uh, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So Paul had taught them sound doctrine. In fact, he had even taught them about the Antichrist. He even taught them about the day of the Lord. This is not new information for them. He taught it by word of mouth or by letter. So there was preaching. Uh, he's probably referring here to the first letter that was that was written, First Thessalonians. Um, by the way, one of the ways in which we can stand firm against false doctrine is to know what God actually says. Uh, one of the ways that you can discern the truth from error, even when it comes to things like news, right? 
if you understand the narrative, if you understand the motivation, if you understand you know, some of that stuff, you can figure out what's, to a certain extent, what's true and, and what's false. But when it comes to the Bible, if you know what the Bible teaches, then you can recognize error. And we must recognize error. We, we often use the illustration of, of money, right? I, I had to, I, so I, 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 hand, I, hand, I handled cash. I was in the cash business when I was in college, and, uh, and I, I worked weekends, so I worked Sunday. So I got saved, and then I worked Saturday. And then I had people give me cash, and, and I had to, like, really, I had to learn how to handle, how to, how to figure out what was real. And so I had, to, I had to figure out, like, okay, I had to look for, like, the little, little hair, the little fibers, right? I had to, I had to, you know, real dollars have the fibers. Real dollars at the time had a strip, and that was before like the the, the, the Franklin face was like flipped and, and that type of stuff. But but I knew how to identify in the late nineties. I knew what genuine money looked like. I knew it up and down. I didn't have one of those pens, right? Someone give me a hundred, and I I sit there and I examine it, and I like I hold it up, and I and I and I look for all the different parts. I I, I forget all the things, but. But there was um, there was like a symbol over here somewhere, and so I'd, I'd look for all these different things because you know what happened? If I took a counterfeit hundred, you know who had to pay for that hundred? I paid the price for taking counterfeit money, and I never paid the price because I never took it. Right? I, 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 I never actually saw counterfeit money as I was working, but I knew what was legitimate. I knew what was genuine. I knew it was real, and I could count all other things against that. And so these guys had the traditions that they were taught. They had the truth from the Apostle Paul, and they could count all these other teachings against what Paul had taught. They could examine it against what was true. We must be able to recognize error today. Uh, are you solidly committed to sound doctrine the way of Thessalonians are? Are you, or are you committed to the truth of God as a way of life, or is it more about some religious thing. Now I understand in this group, I'm, I'm gen generally speaking to the, to the choir here. Um, but there are people where they may hold to some series of traditions as though they were the Word of God. And there are people who may show up for worship and be part of the assembly and it's just kind of like what they do but there's no real commitment to the truth of the word of god sometimes there's a commitment to the truth of the word of god like like theoretically i believe these theologies but then practically that is in real life it's not there i would argue that it's in real life where you really find out what your commitment to sound doctrine is we like to sit around and look, I'm sitting here talking about the election 15 minutes ago. That's, we, we like to sit around and talk about like high theology. But, um, and, and I'm not discouraging that by any means. Uh, but when it comes to real life, do I live out my, my doctrine? Do I, do I live it out? These guys were to stand firm. We're talking about not just their thinking, we're talking about their life. They were to hold to the traditions. It's, it's the way they're standing against apostasy. It's the way they're holding to the truth that Paul's referring to here. Um, do you study that truth? Do you read that truth? Is it part of your daily life? Are you able to recognize truth and error? Uh, Paul's thankful for the Thessalonians' genuine salvation. He encourages them to hold fast to sound doctrine in the midst of persecution. And he prays for them, for comfort and strength in verses 16 and 17. Uh, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Notice the language that, that Paul uses here. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father. Now, now what I want to do here is I want to put a parenthesis right here. I just want you to kind of like take this whole section and just, just press pause on that for a second. All right. We have the subject 
here in verse 16, we have kind of like the, the verb of the sentence here in verse 17. This, this middle part is kind of like a parenthetical side note. All right, we'll, we'll deal with that in a second. But the, the prayer is, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. And these two figures, these two persons, the Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, are equal in the original language. It's a statement of equality here. It's a statement of Jesus' divinity. They are the ones to whom Paul is praying. He's praying to Jesus Christ himself and to God the Father. Now, you don't pray to something that's not divine. I mean, unless you're Roman Catholic, then I suppose you, I suppose you can pray to, uh, you know, Mary. And, uh, who's the one that helps you find things? St. Anthony. St. Anthony! Anthony! Right? You can't forget St. Anthony. And what was Patrick? What was St. Patrick? What was that all about? Because I'm Irish. That's coming up, right? Some Is that a thing? What's that? Snakes? Snakes. Yeah. Snakes. Oh, I hate snakes. No, I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know all the things that people are praying to, but uh, every once in a while I'll find myself like in, inside of a Catholic church for like a wedding or something like that or a funeral. And, uh, and I'm so frustrated. I'm so tremendously frustrated. I, 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 can't, I can't handle it. I'm, I'm there. I'm uncomfortable. It's bothering me. I, I don't want to be there. I feel terrible about it because I feel like I should be there like rejoicing that these people are getting married or, or mourning that this person has died. And all I can do is just see all the, the false doctrine and the error that I see. And, I, and I, I remember seeing a couple going over to a statue of Mary and kneeling down and praying in front of it. We don't pray to people, and we don't pray to angels. We pray to the Lord, we pray to God. And here, Jesus is the one to whom we pray, along with God, our Father. It is a statement of Jesus' divinity. Um, now, now, let me, this little parenthesis, I'm going to argue in the text itself, is a reference to God the Father. Um, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. I'm, I'm going to argue from the text of Scripture, from the original language, that this is all pointing back only to God the Father. That's not diminishing the deity of Christ here. The prayer is to Jesus Christ and to God the Father. This little parenthesis is about God the Father and his actions. Uh, he has loved us. God the Father has loved us. Paul doesn't tell us how he's loved us, but I think it's fairly obvious, right? Can you think of a Bible verse that says anything about God's love for us? Maybe we can think of a few, right? You got one off the top of your head? I, mean, I think most of the people in the room would say John 3.16. That's not the one I had, but that's the one I had. Um, John 3.16. Uh, hey, any kids have that one? John 3.16? Just for a uh, little, little Bible. Is that a hand? You got that? What? John 3.16. Was that a hand? Or you know? We are saying the verse, Joshua. Amen. All right, good. Anyone else? Kids, you guys, you guys know this, right? No one, no one else. Per adventure, there'd be just one more that, kid that would, that would. All right, I'll, I'll let you off the hook on that one if you give me Romans 5 8. And you could do it, King James, if you want. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. No, that's not Romans 5 8. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> Okay, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. It makes me feel better. I feel better. Um, anyone want Romans 5 8 besides Joe? Anyone know Romans 5 8? This is a great verse about God's love. But God commendeth or showed God displayed. You guys might have learned it from. Uh, go ahead. You got it? Someone else. 
I'm on this side of the room is under 60 something years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, go Yeah, it's perfect. That's what I have. I mean, think about these verses for a second, right? God has loved us. Right? We know that God is loved. We see that First John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16. We see that displayed in John 3, 16. God so loved the world. That is, in this way, God loved the world that he gave his only to God the Son. Right? We see God commended his love toward us. That is, God demonstrated his love toward us. And that even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. So we see that love that God has for us. We see uh, that love that God has, even in raising His Son, which you, read, you can read about uh, throughout Scripture, but uh, even Paul will write, write about it in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, as part of the Gospel. He loved us by granting salvation to us who do not deserve it. You can read about that in uh, Ephesians 2, which we'll read about in a, in a minute. And the Thessalonians can take comfort in that love. They can look forward to the ultimate salvation that will result from that love. God the Father has loved us, and God our Father has given us eternal comfort and good hope. It's a reference to the ultimate salvation that God would bring about in the last day. Uh, they, the Thessalonians, can know that although they may face difficulties and persecution in this world, they're awaiting a heavenly world of glory. And notice the means by which this comes. By Who here has memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? Anyone here, uh, you've memorized Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? A couple. If you haven't memorized this verse, memorize it. Right? This, I mean, you could just about preach the gospel in this one verse if you needed to. Joe, was this on my chart 20 some years ago? Was this on the middle? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't stand out. This is this for any other. I gotta think this is there. I just know there was a verse in Colossians. That's all I know. Colossians. Oh, yeah. Um, boy, I wish we could go back to time. And if I had a time machine, I'd go back to that. That's, yeah. That's the only place. Only one use, I think. Just one, yeah. If I had one use, I'd go back and find out what I put on that chart. Um, so, uh, anyway, uh, um, what were we talking about? Ephesians 2 8 9. Who's got it? I didn't start with. For by grace. For by grace. Are you saved through faith? That is, so we have this grace that is, God is extending to us something we don't deserve, something we did not earn. For by grace are you saved through faith, placing our trust in the completed work of Christ on the cross. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man boast. Now, I was going to read some other verses, but for sake of time, I, I really can't. I was going to go to Galatians 2, 16, uh, Galatians 2, 20. In 21, but we just we just really need to, to kind of move on. Salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. Did we, did we do verse nine? We didn't do verse nine, did we? Not of works, lest any man. Do we say it's a gift of God? We didn't say all that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. That's a, that should be memorized. You should you should memorize that. You're gonna use that. If you're a man you're gonna use that. You're gonna use it over. Anyway, um, notice what Paul actually prays for, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father, the ones that he's praying to, may they comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. They're praying for comfort. This is the same word that, uh, that Jesus uses when he promises God's Holy Spirit to us. The, the comforter, the one who would come alongside someone who would help us to help her. And in spite of all this persecution they're going through, they could take comfort in eternity. Paul prays that the Lord Jesus Christ would grant this comfort, that God the Father would grant this comfort. He prays that the Lord Jesus Christ, along with God the Father, would strengthen their hearts in every good work and word. That is, Paul's praying that they would be strengthened spiritually. And this spiritual, this spiritual strength would affect the way they live their lives and the way they even handle the Word of God speak of the Word of God, the way they hold fast to the Word of God. Uh, may God comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Uh, Thessalonian church does not need to be shaken by false doctrine. 
They do not need to be worried about missing the day of the Lord. They don't need to be concerned about the man of lawlessness. They don't need to be concerned about damnation. It is a church that's genuinely saved. It's a church that has handled persecution. It's a church that has displayed their genuine salvation in their faithfulness. A church that has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is growing spiritually, that is persevering through persecution, and Paul is thankful for them. He's thankful for their genuine salvation. He encourages them to stand firm in the sound doctrine that they've been taught. And he prays that they would be encouraged and strengthened spiritually. Uh, even strong churches need this type of encouragement from time to time. And so we, like the Thessalonians, can have confidence in our genuine salvation. We can have resolve to stand firm on sound doctrine. And we can pray for strength and for spiritual growth. We would take